Not, not in the midst of, but after. The invitation of this passage is that you actually come to God in the midst of your doubt. This is why deconstruction of faith is so wildly popular right now. Because I think that the church has not done a fantastic job of helping people engage in their doubts. They just told them, push it down, um, don't talk about it, or work through it, and then come to God. But God says, come to me in the midst of your doubts. Now, what does this look like? A couple of things. One, it looks like really, really honest prayer. This, this is a very honest prayer from this man as he cries out to Jesus. So you don't suppress it, but you seek God in it as you surrender it over to Jesus. Honest prayers that you may need to say tonight. I don't know what it needs to be for you, but maybe you need to say, God, like, I want to believe that you're good, but why do I see so much evil in the world? An honest prayer that you could pray to God. God, I want to believe that you're the healer, but why don't you heal my body or heal the person that I'm praying for? God, I want to believe that you are the provider, but why don't you provide for me a spouse or somebody to date? Because y'all been, you've been trying to, to find someone for quite some time. Now, God, I, I believe that you're all powerful, all knowing and sufficient, but why can't I overcome this addiction if Travis is talking about how it's possible? Here, I don't know what honest prayer you might need to engage in and let the Lord speak to, but honest prayers, the reason why you should bring that prayer to God is because um, honest prayer is how we invite God in. I've talked to a lot of people, it's, it's actually shocking to me. I've talked to a lot of people who have shared a lot of different things and I've asked them, have they talked to God about that? And they've said no. They would rather talk to like a minister or a friend or a pastor or something like that. And I'm like, God actually wants to talk to you about it. And you also bring other people in. I think bringing in your community is a good thing, but you've got to start by bringing it to God in really honest prayer. Doubt, what it does is it's this, it's, this, it's this invitation. It could cause you to push away God, but it also is this invitation to press in to God. Doubt could to do a couple things. It could destroy you, or it could be used to develop you and deepen you. I know this because I've seen my own life and I have battled with this in some very, very unique ways. What will it do for you? My prayer is that we will learn to press into God by bringing it to him in honest prayer. And then the second thing that we would learn as we're pressing into what God has for us in honest prayer, inviting God into it, we would actually learn to doubt our doubts. That me and you would learn to doubt our doubts. That's Jesus, he's getting at this when he, when he says in verse 23, if you can, anything's possible for him who believes. As you start to turn the faith knob up and you start to engage with God, you see God do a work in your life. This is the invitation of God for all of us. Now, how do we, how do we learn to doubt our doubts? A few things that I will list here that have been very beneficial for me and as I talk to others. One, that we would search out our doubt. That we would search it out. So like whenever I was in college, I had um, this moment where um, I was kind of thrown into bewilderment in and, and this place where I doubted like Christianity. And, uh, and, and it came from this thought that maybe you've had, but I was like, okay, so I'm born in the Bible Belt in Texas my entire life um, because God loves Texas. And so, um, and uh, God loves your state too, just not as much. Uh, but but uh, I, 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 I was like, okay, so I'm born in Texas and there's a lot of people that have believed in Jesus. Like most of my family who doesn't even go to church, they would say that they believe in Jesus, right? So like this is very normal, at least in the Bible Belt here in the South. And, uh, and I was like, so do I believe in Jesus just because I was raised to believe in Jesus? Like do what, if I was born in the Middle East and and man, I was told that God is Allah. Would I just believe that Allah was God and I would have just as much of a devout faith? And don't get me wrong, I had my experience with God, but I was going like, but is there anything else? Do I have anything else to stand on? And I was like, I, I, don't, 
I don't know. And so I started to search out my doubt, started reading books like More Than a Car- Carpenter. I started reading books by, by Lee Strobel, The Case for Faith. I started reading books like The Reason for God by Timothy Keller, all books that I've actually read. I started reading, um, it's a very great resource, Faith That Demands or Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist by Norman Geisler. All these things started to build a strong foundation that just gave still reinforcement to the experience I've had with God that I really do believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It all happened by me searching out the doubt. God's not afraid of your questions. God's not afraid of your doubt. He's inviting you to engage with him in the middle of it. And then secondly, as you search out your doubt, um, you, you, I started to learn to do this, that I would trust God against my feelings. As I started to just doubt like God's care for me and things like that, that I would trust God against my feelings. Like my, my feelings and what is true are just so often at a war with each other especially with this anxiety disorder that some, some of us in here wrestle with and that I, I have. And man, like it's, it's, it's created a battle in me that God has created a dependence on him through it. So that's like the silver lining and all that. But I've had this battle of what I feel and what is true. God, I feel like I, I, I'm not, you, how could you use someone like me? I feel like you just can't. God, how are you going to give me words to say to a bunch of students out here tonight? God, I don't know that you will. Man, this morning I was studying this passage and a guy came up to me. I was at Starbucks um, in Wolferth and, uh, and a guy came up to me and uh, I had my laptop open and my Bible open. But there was nothing, there was nothing that said doubt or anything. And it did, it said Mark chapter nine, um, but he, there's no way he could read like my notes because he walked behind me and came here and goes, hey man, I feel like God wants me to tell you something. And I was like, okay. And I was like, here we go. Um, he goes, I feel like God is pressing on me to tell you that man, hey, you shouldn't doubt um, that God's gonna give you something to say but just use your voice. And he he goes, by the way, I have no idea how that's gonna apply to your life. And I was like, what's your name? And he goes, my name's Jesus. I'm joking, his name, (laughs) he he didn't say his name is Jesus. Um, That's not true, but everything else is true. And so, and I go, well, hey, actually, it's really fascinating that you said this because I'm a college pastor. I'm about to preach on doubt tonight. And it's really interesting that that's the word that you use. And his wife was next to him or girlfriend or somebody. um, But she goes, that is so freaking cool. And I was like, that is freaking cool. Um, And man, like I just realized in that moment that God was like, listen, I'm not done with your life. You can trust me. Whenever you think that I'm not there, when you think I'm not going to come through, I'm here and I am. When you think I might fail you, I promise you I'm gonna be faithful. You trust God against your feelings and you see, it's in that that you see your faith grow and you see that your faith grows because you see his faithfulness. And that's for all of us, that you trust God against your feelings and then finally that you would trust the voice that's in your heart instead of the one that's in your head. Right alongside of that, I've learned that I've got to trust the voice in my heart instead of the voice in my head. So often, man, like whenever we went through our two miscarriages, um, I, I was thinking, God, like, like he, he, I prayed about this. I prayed that this wouldn't happen, and it happened anyway. And as Carrie and I, we cried together, and I was holding her. I felt like, man, God, maybe he's not faithful. But God taught me to hold on and that he is, that he is faithful. And he taught me that he is faithful before we got pregnant with our third kid. But God is gonna show you that if you go to him in the middle of it, that voice in your head is gonna be shouting, but there's that still small voice in your heart that's the voice of God that's also speaking, saying, hold on to me. You listen to that and you believe in that. Maybe you're hearing you, 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 the, the thing that's screaming in your mind is, man, like I'm simply too broken. There's good news. If you're thinking, man, I'm just too broken. And maybe you even thinking like, man, I'm not sure why I'm even here. I want to let you know something. Broken people are the only people there are. If God says he's no longer going to use broken people, none of us are in. Okay. And then God loves to pick up no matter how broken the pieces are. God is really great at picking up and picking up those broken pieces and making them whole 
whole again. And that's what God has done in my life. And that's why I'm here. If God can do that in my life, he can do it in yours. You're not too broken for God to make you whole. This is why we all, man, we all need Jesus. We all need what God did in our place. We all need Jesus to heal us, to save us, to set us free. We all need the peace of God. We all need him to put us back together. We all need his redemption. So as we get ready to come to a close tonight, we look to God. We look to God. You learn to doubt your doubts by looking to God. So if you're here and you're thinking, man, my faith is just so small and so weak. Well, this same story in a parallel passage in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, it's this exact same situation. There's just one other line added from Jesus, and you've probably heard it. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus says this. If you go, man, my faith is so small and so weak, Jesus says this. Faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. There's going to be a picture of how small that really is. That's a mustard seed. This tiny, 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 tiny thing can be so powerful. And I just want to ask the question, why? Because we come to God not based on our faithfulness, but his. We come to God not based on our weakness, but his strength. Even when we're faithless, he's faithful. We say this line often here. The mustard seed of faith, even though it's so, so small, it can be so, so effective. And so if you have just that mustard seed of faith, you have a mountain of doubt, that can be enough. Will you come to God in it? So tonight, um, as the disciples come to Jesus in verse 29, Jesus says, this kind's driven out only by prayer. In prayer, it precedes the power of God being unleashed in so many ways. So tonight, we wanted to give you four or five minutes of space to just interact with, encounter, and pray to God. And there's going to be some people in the back with glow sticks on like normal, and then there's going to be some of our staff um, just kind of along the sides here. And if you want to pray with somebody, you don't have to tell them what's going on. You can just say, will you pray for me, and they'll just pray for you. Or if you want to talk, you can't. If you want to come up to this altar as a, as a way to go, God, I'm, I, I, I'm, I believe, but help my unbelief here. And you just lay down whatever it is that you're struggling with and battling with. Would you, you can come and kneel at this place and this be a representation of you saying, God, I'm just laying it down physically before you. So if you want to come kneel at the front as a symbol of that, you're more than welcome to do that. But we want to give you space for the next four or five minutes. Just encounter God and let him meet you at the intersection of doubt and faith. Will you pray? God, we believe. Help our unbelief, God.